Amen, church. It is exciting to be here. I wanted to mention that we have a church bulletin and that the ushers have a copy and we wanted to hand out that bulletin right now. And it covers the idea that numbers just underscore the miracle of God. And which is relevant to some of the things we're going to discuss today in in the scriptures together. I just want to say that I'm grateful to be here and to share the scriptures with you. And uh, we'd like to hand out a bulletin, one per household, please. One per household. We might have enough for a couple extras, too, if you want. That's fine. That's fine. I think our, we, we printed enough for everybody to make sure everybody got at least one per household. And we'll have some extras later. If you want to grab one on the way out, that's two. That's fine as well. But I want to ask you to open your Bible to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to talk about the kingdom of light and the, kingdom, and the dominion of darkness. First, we're going to talk about, I mean, what is that? You know, right? What, 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 what are you talking about? The kingdom of light. Sounds like something from a fantasy novel or something. No, it's actually right out of the Bible. The dominion of darkness. That also sounds kind of epic, doesn't it? Colossians chapter 1. Before we dive into the scriptures and study, study out things this morning, I want to ask that we just say a prayer to set our hearts and minds on God and God's word. So please, uh, bow your heads with me and let's pray. Father, we want to come before you right now. And we want to ask that we can be laser focused on what your word says. That your word this morning can really inspire our hearts and our minds to really go after being close to you. God, I pray that this is a time we strive to reinvent ourselves. That we allow you to reinvigorate us, to change us, to transform us. I pray that your word speaks through me. Take me out of the way and may your word resonate in the hearts and minds and eternity of everyone that's here this morning. I pray that we walk away making decisions to be different men and women. I pray that we don't walk away unaffected by your scriptures. Help us have the intention, the really sharp attention and really focus on your word. But at the same time, God, help our hearts be soft. God, help us love you with all of our hearts and with all of our minds. God, I pray that there aren't any distractions, that you just take this time to really speak to us through your word and inspire us to do more for you, to be closer to you, and ultimately, God, to recognize how deeply and how sincerely and how powerfully you really love us, how you have a plan for us. God, I just pray that your word cuts our hearts and opens our minds today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Colossians chapter 1, verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. He's writing the brothers and sisters in the city of Colossae. That's why this is called Colossians. And, and this letter, Colossians, was read to the brothers and sisters in the church. And he's telling them, look, we, we pray about you all the time. And we thank God for you all the time. Because your faith and your love has been felt throughout the world. I want to tell you, Phoenix Church, that your faith and love for the saints is being felt all over the world. That, that we, can, we, can, we can know, because of our sacrifice, because of... Our heart to sacrifice as a church and to, and to give more than we've ever given. I mean, fully almost $20,000 more than we gave last year. You need to know that churches are being planted in Columbus, Ohio. Churches are being planted in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Churches are being sus- supported and sustained in places like Kinshasa, DRC. Places like Lagos, Nigeria. Places like London, England. Paris, France. There are congregations all over the world. There's even a powerful church in Manila, Philippines. Led by a couple that was actually converted right here in Phoenix. It's to God's glory that your love can be felt all over the world. And that's what's happening. People's lives are changing all over the world because of your heart to sacrifice. Church, that should fire you up. Amen. And I, I believe God wants to bless us right here in Phoenix because last week 
ought to bring your neighbor day. We had more people out of church. We had a record breaking attendance of 231. God wants to do something great here too. Amen. As we keep reading here, let's pick up verse 9. For this reason, since the day we've heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. I don't know what you pray about for the brothers and sisters, but that's an awesome thing to pray about. Verse 10, Colossians 1. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. There it is. The kingdom of light. I don't know how, I don't know what you think about biblical Christianity. I don't know what ideas you may have brought in today about the kingdom of light and what that means. Is that like a Star Wars thing? No, it's a Bible thing. The Bible says there's a kingdom of light and that God wants you to be a part of it and share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. That's amazing. Contrastly, verse 13, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. In him, in him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So there's a contrast here. There's a kingdom of light and a dominion of darkness. Did you notice there's no, like no badlands that are gray? Did you notice that? It's like, it's like a kingdom of light and the gray area that you think you're on. And then the, you know, dominion of darkness. No, there's dominion of darkness, kingdom of light. There's no in between. You're a part of one or you're a part of the other. I'm not sure which one I'm part of. Then you're probably in the dark, because that's the whole idea. When you don't know something, they say that you're in the dark about it. You with me, guys? Well, do not fear. Don't fear. Brings us to our first point. Do not fear. Come into the light. Look in John 3. Well, how do we become a part of this kingdom of the light? I want to know. I don't want to be in the dark about it. Amen? Let's look at what Jesus taught and the Bible teaches about the kingdom of light. We'll pick it up in John, chapter 3. In John 3, there's a lot, bless you. In John 3, there's a lot happening. But we're going to pick it up down in verse 19. This is the verdict. Jesus Christ is saying this. This is the verdict. Sounds pretty hard line, doesn't it? Like somebody slamming a, a, a gavel down. Bam, bam, bam. This is the verdict. Da, don't, don't. This is the verdict. This is what Jesus, like, look, this is the judgment. This is, I'm dropping the hammer here. This is the verdict. Verse 19. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But men and women love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light. And will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they've done has been done through God. Now you've got to dissect this for a second. First it says in verse 20 that when we come into the light something happens. Our evil deeds are exposed. That is not comfortable I don't, if I took a show of hands, who likes being exposed in here? I don't think anybody like, yeah, me, expose me. I mean, no one likes that. The whole idea of being exposed is just embarrassing. No one likes that. But some of us understand how necessary it is. When we like, look, I want to live in the light. I know it's necessary. Because when you walk in the light, your deeds get exposed. But interestingly, okay, so your evil deeds are exposed when you walk in the light. What happens then in verse 21? Whoever lives by the truth comes to the light. So at least you know you're living by the truth. You're not putting on some kind of charade in church. You're really being really you. 
And therefore, you're really going to change and do something new. Amen? And, and you read through this, he goes, so that maybe seen plainly that what he's been done has been done through God. So when you walk in the light, when we walk in the light, guys, and our evil deeds get exposed, yes, it's, it's humbling, right? It's humbling, but at the same time, we know we're living by the truth at least, right? At least we're living by the truth. It could be so much worse. We could just be playing church and wait till it's too late. No thanks, man. You guys still with me on this? So the, okay, so it says walking in the light. Now, what is the light? What does that even mean? I mean, are we talking about, like, you know, your, your, your torch on your cell phone? I mean, what do you, what do you mean light? What, what, okay, I know it's a metaphor for something, but for what, right? Look with me in John chapter 1. Sometimes you just got to back up and find out the context, you know what I mean? John chapter 1. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. If you don't read long in the Bible, that's, that's a say what moment, isn't it? It sounds like I'm rambling almost. Seriously. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and He was with God in the beginning. You're like, what are you saying, man? Sometimes you really got to look at the Scriptures and go, what is this actually telling me right here? We learn a couple things. The Word and God were there in the beginning, the beginning of all things, right? And the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So it's two separate things that are one thing. How does that work, man? I don't know. It's God. If I could figure out how God worked, I don't think I'd be here still. You know what I'm saying? Well, when you figure out God, he disappears. God is eternally, he exists outside of time, and outside of our, our three-dimensional realm, our, our matter. He doesn't exist the same way we do. So when the Bible says there's two and there's one and whatever, I mean, just accept, it's God, man. As intellectual as we want to be, we're not going to figure out every little nuance about God. But we can learn something from this, though. We can learn that through him... Verse 3, all things were made, and without him nothing was made that had been made. In him was life. So in the word was life. And that life was the light, oh, there's the light, of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. If we insist on holding on to our darkness, we will never understand real light, real Christianity and Christ. We won't. The Bible says here, there came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. This is talking about John the Baptist, verse 7. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. John the Baptist testified about Jesus and his coming. So now we have a really strong idea of what the light is. But we also should understand what the Word is and what God is. You with me on this? Because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It was with God in the beginning. Verse 14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We've seen His glory, the, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we learned some things about Jesus. He was with God in the beginning. He was God. He was the Word. He became flesh. He also was the light. That to me was a whoa moment when I started really thinking about it. Whoa, that's what the Bible really says about Jesus? It's so easy to kind of Charlie Brown the scripture sometimes and go, you know, in the beginning, when's it going to be lunch? Man, I've been there before on a Sunday morning. I mean, not lately. I do the ministry thing. It's kind of hard to do, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) But anyway, I can understand that. But, but I want to I plead with you. Do not fear. Come into the light. Yeah. Jesus is somebody you can trust. I mean, look, look what it says in John 8. In John chapter 8, verse 12. John 8, verse 12. Give me an amen if you're there. Amen. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am. The light of the world. Just in case we were unclear, right? Because 
John chapter 1, you got to think about, amen, to make things clear. But Jesus flat out just tells us, I'm the light, guys, just, just in case the last few chapters you didn't get that. I'm the light. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the, of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So guys, in order to have the light, you actually have to follow Jesus. The temptation I know I had growing up was to take the Jesus that I'd heard in church and from tradition and from my own opinions and nuances and craft the Jesus that I was comfortable with. That was based on my experiences, my religiosity, and my perspective. And so I'd follow a Jesus that fit my background, my ethnicity, my perspective. Jesus has nothing to do with any of that stuff. Nothing. We shouldn't have a white church or a black church or a Spanish church. We just have one church. Amen, church? And if we're going to go there, Jesus was actually a Palestinian Jew. So I don't know if you knew that. But he didn't look like anything like, like you or me. He didn't. Unless you're from Palestine. I don't, the only person I know that looks like a Palestinian is Anthony. Amen. 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 I know, I know, but you can't hide it, bro. If we're truly going to be in the light, we've got to truly follow Jesus. We've got to find out who the Jesus is of the scriptures. And we've got to come to him on his terms and go, okay, Jesus, show me how to live. Show me how to walk in your footsteps. We got to hear the teachings of the people that walk with Jesus, listen to him speak, recorded everything about his life, and go, man, I'm going to imitate that guy. Why? Because I really want to follow the light. If you'd asked me, well, before I'd studied the Bible out seriously, if you'd asked me, Jeremy, are you a Christian? I would have said yes. If you'd asked me if I believe in Jesus, I would have said absolutely. But at the same time, I was being sexually immoral. At the same time I was being impure. At the same time I was smoking marijuana. At the same time I was getting drunk. Just like a lot of my other friends who went to church with me. But when I met the Jesus of the Bible, that whitewashed image of him that I would grow up looking at, got set on fire. I'm like, wow. See, we can't invent a Jesus that works for us we got to find the Jesus in the scriptures and work for him. Amen, church? 1 John chapter 1. Walk in the light and live by the truth. That's our second point. Don't be afraid of the light. Just come in the light. Walk in the light and live by the truth. 1 John chapter 1. This is one of my favorite scriptures. There was a point in time in my life when I didn't, I didn't really talk about sin candidly. I would confess enough to look like I was trying to deal with my mess. I would confess just enough to make it seem like I was being open. Because I knew I was supposed to talk about my life. After I studied out the real Jesus of the Bible, I was, man, I gotta, I gotta change some things in my life. Let me just confess some of this stuff. Confessing some of your sin is like a doctor stitching up your surgery halfway. You know what I'm talking about? Can you imagine getting like an, a, you know, appendectomy, your appendix getting taken out, you know, and the doctor like stitches only half of it up, you know, and half is not stitched, and he puts the band-aid on there. You're good, man. And you're walking around. Oh, that doesn't feel very good. How you doing? I'm, I, I'm doing fine. Why are you wincing? I, I'm okay. I'll be all right. Uh. Well, you looks like you're bleeding. Yeah, but I'm not going to die. Yes, you are going to die. Eventually, it's going to get infected. Right? It's not going to heal right. You might get sepsis, which is like an infection in the in, inside of your... It's, it's bad, man. Bad mojo. The dude should finish the job. When you don't get all your sin out, it's just like that. You walk around and it just gets more and more infected. And kills more and more of your relationship with God. Because you just don't deal with the truth. It's like having a broken leg... And they just wrap it in a, a splint. They don't really put it in a cast. They really, and here you're walking around with this broken leg, limping all the time. Anybody puts weight on you, and you got that, that broken leg that's not really patched up right, you're just going to collapse, right? In the same way, if you're not dealing with who you really are on the inside, and what's really going on in your heart, 
then people put weight on you, right? And then you crumple underneath it. And you're getting bittered by the expectations of following Jesus, picking up your cross, and walking in his footsteps. Why? Because you're not in the light. And you're not really getting the healing that you totally need. And so I remember a time in my life where I just would confess some, most, but they're really embarrassing stuff I didn't want to talk about. You know, I'd confess some of the squabbles I'd have with Amy, my wife. I'd be open about some of it. And it became more and more of a festering wound in our relationship and in our hearts. I remember one time sitting in front of the, the, the Romneys. We were supposed to have a mentoring time with them, and we're trying to help them with their marriage. And then, and then, and then Rick sees an interaction between me and my wife, and I said something just very insensitive, just very pig-headed and unrighteous. And she had gotten numb to it. And I would gotten numb to it. Because we hadn't dealt with it. And I love Rick. Rick's like, bro, bro, um, appreciate your help today. <laughs> Can I just bring up something I think I see right now? And he, he respectfully went after me. He said, brother, when you just talked to your wife, you brought this up, that up, pointed out how insensitive and sinful I was. And then, and then, then, then my wife just, just gushed. She's like, oh, yeah, and it's been happening for a while, and this has been going on, and, this, and all these feelings came out that she was feeling. And I was like, what have I done? Here's what I did. I walked around with the stitches not finished. And it got infected, and it got worse and worse and worse, slowly over time. And thank God somebody said something. Somebody noticed the infection of sin and, and brought it up and said, bro, what's wrong? And they pulled on the little stitches like, wow, this is a mess. Yeah, and we stopped everything. We took some time off, went to, to, to Los Angeles, sat down. I was supposed to serve on a jury. This is so good for my heart, guys. Just Let me just be open. I'm supposed to serve. As, I'm in this thing, and the judge is like walking through everybody who's going to serve on the jury panel. And I have scheduled during the, the court case time to go to Los Angeles to get with my friends and work on my marriage because all this stuff had come out. And so I stand up in front of the judge, and I'm like, in front of like a crowd about this size, and I'm like, um, I can't serve on this because I'm having problems in my marriage. And I'm going to Los Angeles to see some counselors about it during the time of the... And I just felt, all of a sudden, I just felt super embarrassed. Because I realized how much my... I mean, I would start meeting people. I even got a couple phone numbers inviting people out to church. And I thought, man, if I don't deal with this, I'm just a, I'm just a huge hypocrite. And I'm not going to be able to help anybody. I've got to help myself. I've got to get real. I've got to get some help. I thank God for people... Challenging me. I thank God for exposing that. It saved my life. Saved my marriage. Yeah. Protected the church. Yeah. Now, if I can struggle with that, I know some of us can too. Yeah. So I can't help but want to read First John to you. Amen? Because it helps my heart. First John 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of his son, Jesus, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... To God and God alone. Oh, that's not what it says? Oh, I know that's what some of us think. But that's not what it says. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we've not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. We're supposed to use the word on each other in the church. But like, Rick did not just, you know, bro, you know, I see your problem here is your sin. No, Rick got the Bible out. When we went to Los Angeles, it wasn't like we sat down and got a bunch of psychological counseling and that's it. No, no, no. We said that people use the Bible because we got open about where we were really at. They could use the Bible. The Word had a place in our life. And we could have hope and transformation and repentance. 
Hope, transformation, and repentance are around the corner for you. But you've got to decide you're going to walk in the light. You're really going to follow Jesus. You've got to make a decision you're going to do that. Don't come to church to warm a seat up. Come to church to transform. Come to church to let the Bible give you a vision about God and about who you can be. Don't let Satan fool you into staying stuck in who you are, who you think you are. You walk in the light, and there is transformation. Amen. Look at 1 John chapter 4. Sometimes we're just afraid. You know what I'm saying? We're just afraid. We don't want to talk to people because we're afraid. We're afraid of punishment. We're afraid of consequence. And that's understandable. It's embarrassing. We're afraid to be embarrassed. Who likes, nobody likes to be embarrassed. No one wants to sign up for that. But when we all realize that nobody is in this room is better than anybody else, that at the foot of the cross it's a level playing field, no one can look down or up at one another, we can look at each other and help each other out. When we realize that, then we're a lot less embarrassed and we remember, man, this is about God's love and about really being real with God and worshiping and serving the real God, not a God or a Jesus that we've contrived, put together with our traditions and kind of made up because it works for us. First John chapter 4, are you with me? Verse 18. There's no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. God's love is perfect, and God's intent is not just to punish you. God is not looking for an opportunity just to punish you. That's not who he is. He will discipline you. Mind you, he will discipline you. Because he's a good father, and good fathers do that. But when I discipline my son, I'm not like excited to give him a spanking. You know what I'm saying? I'm not like, wow, can't wait to get my son. I'm not rejoicing that I get to discipline my kid. doesn't bring me any satisfaction when he goes that far out of bounds and needs a discipline. But his broken and contrite heart, his change, that is awesome. I love being a father because I can see my kids' hearts change from time to time. And it reminds me of how God must feel when I make a heart change. How are we going to make God feel after today? You with me on this, guys? James 5. Let's just take a look at this one before we move on to the next point. James chapter 5. Give me an amen when you're there. James 5, verse 16. Please read along in the scriptures. I hope they speak to you. Amen. Therefore, confess your sins to the minister. Is that what it says? Therefore, confess your sins to God alone. Is, is that what your Bible says? Wow. Okay, let me, let me just take away my glasses of rationalization right here. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. You see, it's about healing. Revealing is about healing. It's not about condescending. It's not about punishment. It's not about judgment. It's about helping each other get healed. And when I sat down for the first time and actually confessed my sin to the brothers, brothers to brothers, okay? Sisters to sisters, just want to, okay? Talk to us about the brothers. When I got open about the things of my marriage, when I, got open, when I first studied the Bible and got open and walked through the sins I needed to overcome, the things that were weighing me down with guilt, that were hardening my heart, the bitterness I had towards my father and the hatred I had towards him and, and the sins I had towards my brother and sister and the, just the mountain of sin I was dealing with in my life that I turned a blind eye to and anesthetized with my religion. I remember the freedom I finally felt. And the spiritual fireworks that ensued. I remember being able to celebrate right on March 11th, 1992, that I was really in the light and I was finally free because I'd been baptized for the forgiveness of my sins. Amen. We got to understand the impact of hiding sin versus revealing it and confessing it. Hiding sin becomes an infection. Eventually, you, 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 can, you can teach yourself to exist in church, but not really be a part of it. You can teach yourself to, to make it through another religious experience instead of experiencing God. But real transformation comes when you walk in the light. Amen, church? 
Look with me in Ephesians 5. We come to our last point here. Have nothing to do with darkness. Be light in the Lord. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Let's pick it up in verse 3. Now, just to give you a little context, historically, this was written to the church that met in Ephesus. Ephesus was an ancient Greek city on the coast of modern-day Turkey now, and it's been abandoned for a while, but Ephesus was a learning center. The famed lecture hall of Tyrannus was there. Acts 19 kind of covers the evangelization of Ephesus. Ephesus was a significant city. It's the city that all the other churches in the province of Asia, modern-day Turkey, were planted from Ephesus. There were seven churches addressed in the book of Revelation, and they all came from the church in Ephesus. So this is a very powerful group of brothers and sisters in the Lord. And again, this is a letter, Ephesians, written to be read to and address the church there in Ephesus. So it's read to people who made the commitment to follow Jesus. Do you hear me on this, guys? That's, that's, this letter is written to those kinds of people who've really said, Jesus is Lord. They, they, they're following Jesus. They've repented of their sins. They've been baptized. That, that's who this is written to. Doesn't mean that you can't get anything out of it. Yeah. Ephesians 5, verse 3. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual morality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. You have a clear, clear idea right here what darkness looks like. Not even a hint. Of those three things, sexual morality, impurity, or greed. Now, you may wonder, what, what, is, what does that mean, sexual morality? Well, if you look at the Bible's definition of what sexual morality is, you've got to figure out what the Bible says is moral first. The only physical relationship the Bible condones is between one man and one wife. Jesus made that really clear. He said, look, Moses allowed you to marry more than one person because your hearts were hard, but what God wants is one man and one woman, period. That's it. That's all the Bible condones. That's all the Bible will consider moral. Everything else outside of marriage is sexually immoral. Everything else. That's Bible. And this is not even a hint of that. Not even a hint of it. Wow. You know, that flies in the face of most of what we think today in our society. Most, most music today. Is all, of, all the romance is about a sexually immoral relationship. Right? I, I, I listened to a song the other day. It's a really pretty song. And I'm like, wait, did he just say what I think he said? It's okay if we end our marriage in the morning or break up in the morning. We're just going to be married for a night. My son, who's six years old, in the middle of the song goes, I, I don't like this song. I think it's inappropriate. When it comes to that guy's spirituality, I, th I think he's like outer space or something. And, 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 and I, I just, I really, it made me think. I thought, man, what our society accepts is so far. Even what our society calls Christians. I mean, that's why it says, verse, verse uh, 6 there, let no one deceive you with empty words. Because a lot of people rationalize this. They, 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 have, they have a hint of immorality, or, or they commit immorality, or their impurity. Impurity is got impurity is pretty broad. Let me, let me just give you the Greek word, ekatharsi. It just means like uh, unclean, and it can mean like you know petting and that sort of thing, but also can mean like polluting your body, like with drugs and that sort of thing. Okay, so so, and then greed. Now greed, that's the United States of America, guys. We are known, right? If you know anybody from other countries, we're known for having a greedy culture. I mean, if you don't think so, I, I let my, we had cable for like a brief stint. Never again, amen. <laughs> my kids would watch TV, and they'd watch Cartoon Network. They're really into the Teen Titans. That's another time. But, um, so, so my kids would watch this favorite show, and then, and then like three days later, my kids are asking me for stuff. 
I'm like, why are you asking me for stuff? You never asked me for stuff before. Oh, yeah, I want to get this thing or that thing. And then I sat down and watched the show with them. And every commercial, they're like, buy this. This will be fun. Your life will be awesome if you have this toy or this thing. And my kids are, they're eating it up like candy. And they're like, they want to get this thing and that thing. And they see mom and dad playing with them. And, they, and they're sold this lie from the television that if you get things, it's going to bring the family together. And I said, I just watch it. I'm like, wow. Now, I took some psychological courses on persuasion, so I'm a little jaded when it comes to commercials. But at the same time, I'm like, that's what my kids are doing. And now they want this stuff, and they're struggling because they're not going to get this stuff. And that's, and how many kids, and how many of us watch TV like that, and we're fed this kind of thinking our whole life? No wonder people look at our society and go, man, you guys struggle with greed. I'm like, no, I'm not rich. Yeah, you are. If you have more than food and clothing, you're, you're rich, man. Because millions and millions and millions of people go without food and clothing. And we complain because their cell phone's old. Or at least I do. The Bible says not even a hint to these things. And it says foolish talk. Did you see that? Verse 4. Obscenity. Foolish talk, coarse joking. Some of us have no conviction about this. When I came into the church, I didn't have conviction about this either. See, I grew up, half my life I grew up in Missouri, growing up. And living in a trailer, we, we didn't have any money, okay? I don't know how we ended up in Hawaii, but we did. So I moved from Missouri to Hawaii. And I'm like, what just happened? I'm in a foreign country. I was freaking out. I went from white bread, white-centric USA, trailer park, to how's it, bro? Like, what did you say to me, man? I was so confused. But at the end of the day... In both places, I saw one thing in common. A lot of coarse joking, a lot of obscenity, a lot of foolish talk, a lot of impurity. It's not like because the culture changed, the sin changed. Same sins, slightly different delivery mechanism. Same appetites, same destruction, same entrapment, same thing. Different accent, same coarse joking. At the end of the day, I thought, obscenity? Does that mean like... Cussing? Yeah, that means like cussing. Here, let me give you another scripture to clarify this. Look in Colossians with me. We got a conviction on this, guys. We're supposed to be God's holy people. Supposed to live where? In the light, not in the dark. Colossians 3, verse 8. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. How do you know if it's a curse word? Well, what's it about? Does that have to do with defecation or urinating? Well, it's filthy. Right? I mean, aren't those things filthy? I mean, it's, some of these things are obvious, like body parts for such things. Like, why would you say that? Well, I just got to get across how I feel. Listen, Jesus Christ made a whip out of cords, walked in the temple, kicked tables over, cracked the whip, and shout out to people, how dare you turn my father's house into a market? Get these out of here. Did you notice he didn't curse at all? If we're going to be in the light, we've got to follow who? Jesus, who is the light, so we can be light. So when we're upset, we can't be using filthy language. Why? It's improper for God's holy people. You're not living in the light. Now, when I became a young Christian, I had this vocabulary that was just disgusting. I mean, I completely did not live like this. And so I had to scrub my brain, wash it with a Brillo pad of the Bible, and get open when I like, had the filth and flour come out of my mouth. Because I didn't, I, didn't, I, I didn't have conviction on it. Why? Because I didn't have conviction on the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. I didn't believe the Lord was near, and I didn't believe God was in me. Now that I have kids, I'm even more vigilant. I'm like, wow. And if I start thinking or feeling those kinds of thoughts, I mean, I'm like, oh, i got to pray about this. Because I already know the reason I'm feeling that is because I'm angry. And anger is something i got to get rid of. Why? I want to live in the light. It doesn't mean you stuff your feelings. Like Jesus, it means when you talk about them, you don't have to use filth and flour and obscene language and filthy language. You don't have to do that. Because if you're doing that, you're not in the light. You're not walking in the light. Walk in the light. Well, how am I supposed to handle my emotions? Do what Jesus did. You know what he'd do? He'd get on his knees and cry out to God with all of his guts. When's the last time you've done that about the feelings you had? 
was the last time you got on your knees and just prayed out to God? Say, God, help me transform. Change the things I don't know how to change right now. When's the last time you wept before God? Why can't it be today? Why can't it be later today? Why can't you find yourself on the mountaintop? What's a little hot? Maybe find a cool place. I don't know. Why can't you? Why can't you transform? Take it to God. There's nothing God can't change in a person. There's nothing God can't transform. There's no heart condition that God is unfamiliar with. He's the perfect physician for the soul. And if you walk in the light and strive to walk in the light, you will be transformed. And I love how it says, go back to Ephesians. We'll close out this point here. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 8. Give me an amen when you're there. The Bible says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Isn't that awesome? Where'd they all start off at? They were darkness. But then through following Jesus, they became what? Light. That is the transformation God wants every single one of us to go through. You were once darkness. That's where everybody starts off at. No, no, no. I mean, I was, I was born, you know, in the light. I, I've always been in the light. How does it? Are we reading the same Bible? Or do you just want to believe what you want to believe because it's convenient for you to invent a religion that fits your agenda? Sometimes that's what we want to do. We just, oh, you know, I don't, I don't really agree with that. So, uh, you know, I don't believe it. Well, you don't agree with the Bible. Well, that's your interpretation. Really now? Really? I don't want to interpret that. You were once darkness. That's not the only place the Bible says that, FYI. I mean, you know, why don't we look at this? First Peter, take a look at this one. We're going to come back to Ephesians 5, so bookmark it if you need to. Look at First Peter. Sometimes we equate, you know, going to church growing up as, I just assume I'm in the light. Why would you assume that? That's dangerous, man. I don't want to assume anything. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Everybody starts in the dark, and they need to be called out of the dark into the light. That's where we all start. Some of us headed back there. Why? Probably because we didn't open up about what was really going on in our hearts. We didn't talk about the temptations. Maybe we got lonely and got idolatrous of a male or female relationship. Maybe, maybe we got embittered by the sacrifice demanded by, from the cross by us, and we just we didn't really deal with it. And then we walked around with this festering wound. We, we confessed some of it, but not all of it. And then pretty soon we just got crushed. Yeah. But when you walk in the light, God purifies you from everything Amen. and gives you the strength to stay in the light. Because it's not by our strength. It's by His. Amen, church? Amen. Have nothing to do with darkness. Be light in the Lord. Let's go back to Ephesians 5 and we'll close out this point here. Verse 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Did you realize you have to find that out? You actually have to study the Bible and find out what pleases the Lord. I hope that you'll study the Bible and find out what pleases the Lord. Well, I've read the Bible. I know, I've read the Bible too, and I'm still finding stuff that pleases the Lord. I've been reading the Bible for 25 plus years now, and I'm still finding stuff that pleases the Lord. Seriously. I'm like, wow, I didn't know that pleased the Lord. Why? Well, you've read the Bible, you've got a degree in ministry, yeah, 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 but I'm still finding stuff. It's a relationship, and relationships mature, and they evolve. Amen, church? Yes. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. God has given you an opportunity to wake up today. You know, earlier we prayed. We prayed. 
with Alfonso because his family lost their cousin. He took his life, guys. The CDC reports that suicide is up 25% since 1999. People are losing sight of the light. They're starting to see through the cracks of religious hypocrisy. They're getting disillusioned. And hope is not, people don't believe they can find hope in, in the kingdom of God. Church has become something people associate with hypocrisy. Really, the only difference between us and anybody else is whether or not we'll deal with our own hypocrisy, honestly. Yeah. I, if you're ready to do that, then you're ready to get back on track and walk in the light. Yeah. Don't fear. Come into the light. Walk in the light, live by the truth. Have nothing to do with darkness. Be light in the Lord. Look at me in Galatians 3. We'll close out here. Galatians 3. Verse 26. Galatians 3, 26. You are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Baptized into Christ and clothed with him. We just learned that Jesus is light. You can be clothed in light. That's awesome. The Bible promises too that we can be a son or daughter of God. That's a real closeness. That's a real depth. That's a deep relationship. I thought it was so moving when Lem talked about losing his dad and how hard that was for him. God knows what it's like when we don't have a father figure in our life. Some of us have father figures that were abusive. Some of us have father figures that just weren't around at all. Some of them were just, they just didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to be a dad. Listen, your heavenly father... He knows how to be a father. He knows how to be a dad. And I look at my track record, right? Never meeting my biological father till I was 30. Having four different, four different stepfathers that I never really connected with. And not having a clue about how to be a dad. But now I know because of God and the kind of father he is, I can follow Jesus and be in the light. And because I'm a disciple of Jesus and I'm really trying to just follow God, and I'm making my mistakes as I go, but I know I can be a great father. Right. And I can raise my kids to learn how to love, to be confident. Yeah. What adventure awaits you? What challenge, what change awaits you? What transformation is on your horizon? If you just decide you're going to be a part of the kingdom of light and you're going to get out of the dominion of darkness. Amen. Thank you and God bless.